Well, happy 4th of July weekend, all of you celebrating in this drizzly, rainy weekend. Uh, but we're going to have a great time uh, celebrating our summer splashdown next week. We're going to have the world's, well, not the world's largest, Shawnee's largest, well, maybe not China. We're going to have a large water slide <laughs> next week. We're going to have a lot of fun with all the kids, so please make sure you come out next week for that. Uh, but today uh, and this weekend, we're celebrating our country's 240th birthday. How about that? Yeah, that's a great thing. So what I thought we'd do this morning is I want to pray for our country as we celebrate our 240th birthday. I want to thank God for just all the freedoms and blessings that we have living in a wonderful country such as America. So join with me as we pray and thank God for America. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that we have here in the United States of America. We don't take those for granted. We thank you, O oh God, for the freedom that you give us. We thank you that We've been so blessed by those who have gone before us, who have laid down their lives in service of this country so that we could live free. And Father, we pray for America at this juncture and season in our country's history. Uh, God, we pray that your kingdom would come in America, that your will would be accomplished. Father, we pray for our president and we pray for our congressmen. Lord, we ask that you would continue to grant them wisdom and insight and understanding. God, we stand in place of our country this morning and we repent as well. Lord, for all of our wrongdoings, for all of our wrongs, for all of the paths that we have gone down that have been contrary to your ways. Lord, would you forgive us as a nation? God, would you cleanse us? Lord, would you set us on a clear path? Father, I pray that you would bring an awakening to the church and you'd bring revival to those who don't know you. God, we pray for a mighty move of your Holy Spirit in our nation. Lord, that people would be drawn to you from the west to the east, to the north and to the south. We're asking, oh God, that you would move upon our nation. Lord, as we think about the elections coming up, Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come. Lord, that you would have mercy on us. And Lord, that you would continue to drive us and propel us towards you and not away from you. God, we trust in you because you're a big God, and we look to you. God, at the end of the day, we recognize that our citizenship is not here, but it's in heaven. And so we keep our eyes fixed and focused on you, the author of life. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, be with us today as we open up your word. We pray that you would speak to us, that you would open up our hearts and whisper into our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, today begins a brand new series called Life Hacks. Can you say Life Hacks with me? Life hacks. Some of you have probably never heard the term life hacks before. Some of you might think about like hack in terms of somebody that's trying to hack into your computer or hack this or whatever. But the term life hack uh, has to do with problems that we face in life. Usually there are tricky problems that we're faced with in life. Like, you know, how do you eat a popsicle without the juice running down onto your hands? I mean, that's a real problem in life, isn't it? Especially during this hot season. Well, not today so much. But you know what they say? They say that you should take a little cupcake tin, put it upside down, and punch it through the bottom, and then you can eat your popsicle without all the juice running down. See, that's a life hack. That's a clever solution to a tricky problem. Yeah. So we face all kinds of tricky problems in our lives. All this month, we're going to be looking at spiritual life hacks. We're going to be looking in the book of Proverbs, written by King Solomon, and we're going to look at clever solutions to life's tricky problems. I think one of life's tricky problems that we tend to deal with that's challenging for most of us is this notion and idea of fear. That most of us are faced with fear in our lives, and if we're not careful, 
uh, it can debilitate us. I was looking at an article that talked about the three most uh, difficult and challenging fears that Americans face. The top three fears that Americans face. And uh, fear number one, I think we have it on the board here. Number three is a fear of snakes and spiders. Anybody here afraid of snakes or spiders, big ones, covering? Anybody have dreams about snake? Yeah, okay, yes. So think of that movie, right? Snakes, why did it have to be snakes? Uh, number two, the number two uh, fear in America is the fear of heights. Anybody else? You can struggle with that. I see, oh man, this section right over here is really afraid of heights. Really afraid of heights. Okay, now we know. This must be a lower section or something. Uh, fear of heights. All right. And then uh, the number one phobia in America is public speaking. Speaking in public. People, yeah, I have hands already raised right over here. Yeah. Now, this, I found this interesting. Fear of public speaking is worse than the fear of death. Wow. Some of you really don't want to speak. Uh, but fears, we want to talk about this. The, the book of Proverbs uh, talks quite a lot about fear and how we deal with the issue of fear. And so that's what we want to kind of dive in today in, in Scripture. Um, fear, I've found, is most fabricated uh, in your mind. Fear happens right here. It's most alive in the fabrication of your mind. The struggles that you have, the what ifs, the man, I wish things would have been this way, or man, I, I don't know what they think, and so because I don't know what they think, I'm not sure what decisions I'm going to make, and if I knew how they felt, then I would do this, and, and I'm not so sure what my boss thinks about this, or I don't know about what my parents think about. Anybody ever have those thoughts in between your ears right here that kind of go on? This whole idea of just not quite sure what other people think. And if you're not careful, those things can really latch into your heart and into your spirit. And Proverbs talks quite a bit about this idea of fear. Now, Proverbs starts out with this first scripture in Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7, and it gives the whole premise for the book of Proverbs. It says this, that the purpose of the Proverbs is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right and just and fair. This is why we study the Proverbs. Because it teaches each one of us how to live a successful life. So it begs the question this morning, how many of you want to live a successful life? To do things that are just and fair and right. I hope every single one of you would have your hands raised and say, yes, Pastor David, that's me. I want to live a successful life. I want to do what's just and fair. Well, the book of Proverbs, King Solomon would say this, listen to my wise sayings. And as we look through the book of Proverbs, it kind of gives us this foundation. So as we look at this idea and concept of fear, I want to hear what then King Solomon has to say about this. And this is out of the message translation, but this is what he has to say. He says, the fear of human opinion disables. Let me let that sink in just for a second. The fear of human opinion disables. So this idea of the fear of man or the fear of other people or the fear of your boss or the fear of your kids or the fear of your parents or the fear of what other people think about you, it disables you. It disables you. It gets you stuck in life. And if you're not careful, fear can be so disabilitating. It can be something that just so closes you in. And if you're not careful, you'll get stuck in life. And as we read through the Proverbs, we're going to come to find out 
what is the spiritual hack or what's the solution to this tricky problem in life that we have. But let me first kind of talk a little bit about this idea of the fear of man. What exactly is that and how do we respond to it in our lives? I would say first and foremost that as young people, we would say the fear of man would be peer pressure. It'd be peer pressure. It's another word for the fear of man or the fear of human opinion is that as maybe young people or teenagers, we're afraid about what other people think. We're, we want to do things that we don't really want to do, but we end up doing them anyway because everybody else is doing them. It's like your parents used to say, well, if everyone else is going to jump off of a bridge, are you going to jump off of a bridge? That's what peer pressure is. And a lot of teenagers will say, yeah, sure, of course. It's safe. It's okay. Right? That's what fear is. The fear of human opinion is that peer pressure. And we struggle with it as young people. And, and I've noticed that if you have tend to struggle with that peer pressure as a teenager, it tends to follow you throughout the rest of your life. It's something that you struggle with. Well, maybe you never really struggled with this whole idea of peer pressure, but maybe you struggle as an adult with this concept called people-pleasing. You tend to be one of those who always says yes when there's some kind of problem. When someone is looking for something, you're the first person to put your hand up and say, yeah, I want to help. I want to get engaged. I want to do this. I want to do that. And before you know it, you're so overwhelmed with so many things that you can't keep up with life because you have an unhealthy balance in your life because you always want to make other people happy. Am I speaking to anybody else here today that might kind of struggle with those kind of issues? That you put other people so much further uh, in front of you that it becomes unhealthy in your life. Well, if that hasn't hit you yet, let me talk about something else. And this is something that kind of came out, oh, in the 80s, in the mid-80s. And this is this whole idea of being codependent. Some of you struggle with codependent relationships. In other words, what happens is that you're, you as an individual may be helping someone that has some issues in their life. Maybe they're struggling with alcohol addiction or drug addiction or they're struggling with some kind of issue in their life. And as you as an individual, you come and you try to help them and be their savior, so to speak. And then you find your identity in helping them. And what happens is that you have this unhealthy balance and relationship between each other. You have have a fear of not being wanted and loved and you find your identity in that. So we struggle with these things, peer pressure, and we struggle with being people pleasers and sometimes codependent relationships. All of these things are really come under the, the same guise and the same banner of really having a fear of what other people think. You have a fear of man or a fear of human opinion. You know, I've shared this story before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it again. When I was, um, oh, I don't know, probably about 15 years old, uh, I had my uh, very first, like, real girlfriend. And uh, we met, it was in middle school, and um, I eyed her. She had, you know, uh, long blonde hair, and um, she, you know, hit me right away, and I looked at her, and somehow, I don't know even how it happened, but we began having a conversation with each other, and um, as a result of that, like, we started, like, going out, but because we were so young and didn't drive and do anything, going out didn't really mean anything, it's just that we were going out. We weren't, like, seeing anybody else. And so, you know, in middle school, the big thing was to write notes to each other, and so we would like pass notes to each other in the halls. I don't even know what we, I don't even remember what the notes said, but we would pass notes and I would like long for those notes after a period of class and I would wait for her to come to me and, and I could smell the waft of her perfume as she went by and she handed me this little note and it just, it did my world really good to be able to get through middle school because nobody likes middle school. No one wants to be in middle school, but when you have a girlfriend that you're going out with but not really going anywhere, but she gives you a note, that's a really big deal. So this is what I experienced in my life, and it was really important, and life was going really well until one day when Beth came by, and as she came by, things didn't seem quite right. She didn't give me that big smile like she normally would. 
she had a little downcast glance as she passed me a note. As I opened up the notes as she went by, I read the words that sent terror in my heart. David, I really like you, but let's just be friends. Oh, the dagger was twisted in my heart. Forever will be broken by Beth. And I remember, and I'm not sure exactly how the wording came out, but as I went home that day, uh, I remember, and, and I went in, my mom was there, and she greeted me after school, and, and I explained to her kind of what was going on, and, and she said these words, and I'm sure some of you have probably heard these words too, and she says, oh, David, it's all right, I love you, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, mom, I don't care if you love me, I'm glad that you love me, but I want Beth to love me. <laughs> Anybody ever felt that way before? <laughs> Mom, I love you, Dad. I love you, and it's, and it's important that you love me, but, man, I, I, I need somebody else to love me. And I found that to be the case with people that I've talked to over the years, is that they know that God loves them. They know that God cares for them, but there's this hole within their heart that they believe they need to be filled by someone else. You see, that's the fear of man. That's the fear of human opinion when we begin to put people above God. When we want something more in our life than what God can give us, then we've entered into that realm where we say that fear of human opinion, it disables us. It cripples us. It keeps us from the things that God has for us. And so I'd ask the question for you today, is God enough for you? Is his love and his power, is it, is it good enough for you? Or do you need just a little something else? See, the, the issue is, is that we tend to place other people above God. We make other people big, and we make God small. That's what the fear of man is. That's what codependency is. That's what peer pressure is all about. That's what people pleasing is all about. Is that when we make people really big and we make God really small. That's what the fear of man is. And so the spiritual hack is simply this. That the antidote or I would say the most radical thing that we can do to contradict the fear of man in our lives. The most radical thing that we can do is have a healthy fear of God. You see, we need to make God big and people small. We need to make sure that God is huge, as someone would say, huge in our lives, and we make people small. Not that people aren't important, but they're just not as big as who God is. You see, we could put it another way. The fear of God is this, is replacing people with God. Because if you're not careful in your people pleasing and in your peer pressure and in your codependent relationships, if you are not careful, you'll allow them to take the place of God in your life. And what's going to happen is that you'll find out that they'll control you instead of allowing God to control your life. And I would wager to say that most of us would rather have God dictating and controlling our lives than having other people. Because other people aren't as nice and friendly and faithful and good and holy as God is. And when you replace that in your life, it becomes difficult and challenging. See, Jesus said this. He said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't touch your soul. For only God can destroy both your soul and your body in hell. Now Jesus is talking here, and this is, he's getting to the root of this. This fear of man, this fear of human opinion. He says, listen, don't worry about what other people think. Or even, I'll take another step further, don't worry about what they can do to you. Now, Jesus mentions here the, the fear of destruction, of being killed, but we could take it even further in our own lives here in 21st century America. Don't be afraid about other people in your life, about what they think and what their opinions are. Don't be afraid about the market or your boss or you fill in the blank. You make God big in your life and like let people be small. 
And Jesus says, rather fear God. And that's the spiritual hack. That's the antidote to the fear of man. As Jesus is talking, he wants to make sure that he undercuts this this pervasive fear that keeps us from accomplishing all that God wants to accomplish in your life. I've said this so many times to you as a congregation, but but our, our vision statement is here is connect, commit, create. You see, God wants to create through you. He's got a purpose for your life. He wants to fulfill amazing things through your life. And if you're not careful, the fear of man, the fear of what other people think will keep you from being able to create what God wants to do in your life. You see, human opinion, the fear of human opinion It disables you from all that God has for you. And I don't want that to be the case in your life. So today I want you to think about God being big and majestic in your life. Let's think about that just for a second. As we wrestle with the opinions of others, as we wrestle with uh, being people pleasers, and as we wrestle with, with maybe codependent relationships in our lives, how do we really break that? Well, I would, I would say this first and foremost, as we make God big, we need to be intense, we need to be sure, we need to be those that walk through, we need to be those that study and understand how great and wonderful and amazing and how big God is. I think the church in America, I think us here in this room, that we have too small of an opinion of who God is. That we've become so used to the idea of God that we don't recognize his holiness. We don't recognize his grandeur and his majesty. I was looking the other day at a video and it and it showed and I wanted to play it but it was a little bit too long but it shows how small we are maybe you've seen those videos when it takes a picture of planet earth and then it begins to zoom out and you see where we are in relation to the moon and then it zooms out even further and it shows you the relationship we are to some of the other planets and then it shows you the relationship to earth from the sun and then it goes from one galaxy to another and you realize how small and tiny we are and then you place that on top of this understanding that God created it all that God created everything that we can see as we look out into the nighttime stars as we see the skies above us God created all of those things Everything that we can see, everything that the scientists have been able to see through the Hubble telescope and beyond, that there are things that we do not know about currently right now. It's beyond our understanding. You see, that's who God is. He's beyond our understanding. You see, his faithfulness and his goodness to you, it's beyond comprehension. His grace towards you when you fall and fail and make mistakes, it's beyond your understanding. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed your sins from you for those who place your trust in Jesus. I think we forget about how wonderful and glorious God is. And today I want to remind you that God is big. And as big as he is... In those videos, it also kind of goes down deep. So it takes you from the galaxies to the sun, to the planets, to the moon, to the earth. And then it brings you back into who you are. And then it goes into the cell level and the atom level. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is the verse that comes to my mind when Psalms 139, where the David says this, he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God formed me and knitted me and fashioned me in the womb. This is how much God loves you. The creator of the universe loves you. And so if we can understand how big God is, we shouldn't fear what other people think. We should fear a holy God who lovingly created us. 
But this is a side of God that we don't talk about too much. Not only does he love us and care for us, but you see this God who is so big and so huge, he's also holy and righteous and just and perfect. I'm going to say that again. He's holy and right and just and perfect. He's sinless. Totally and completely righteous. And has been that way before the dawn of time. Before creation. Before the worlds were formed. God has been and always has been. No one ever created him. He's just been. And he's been perfect. And as he steps into our world, the world that he fashioned, the world that, that well, we messed up. When we walked away from him and wanted to do what we wanted to do because we sinned. And then God stepped in and said, I love this creation so much that he sent his son, perfect, holy, and righteous, to live a perfect, sinless life so that we could have right relationship with God. Let that sink in just for a second. The God of the universe stepped in, into our fears, into our frustrations, into our failures, into all of those things. He stepped in so that we could be whole again. This is how big God is. And then he took it one step further. He died on a cross for me and for you. So that his blood would pay the penalty for our sin. That's how big God is. He loves you that much. I want to make sure that we understand that when it comes to fearing other people and others' opinions and other thought and peer pressure and codependency and people pleasing, that we have to turn our gaze from those wrong relationships, those second guesses, those things that so cloud our hearts, and we have to cast our gaze on the perfection and beauty of God. And this is what he longs for you. He desires for each one of you to not only be filled with his love, but to be filled with his, what we call righteousness, his right standing. And it only comes because of God. So I say all that to say we can only have a healthy fear of God when we recognize who he is and he's holy and we can only step into his presence we can only come towards God we can only meet him when we ourselves are holy we can only have communion with him true communion true fellowship true relationship with him through the blood of Jesus Christ and it's by his grace and by his grace alone but Make no mistakes, we can't enter into that presence. We can't enter into the relationship without the blood of Christ. That's the way it is because we're sinful creatures, but because of the grace of God, because of the love of God, because he poured out his life to save us, we can have relationship with him. The Proverbs goes on and it continues this way. The fear of human opinion disables, but trusting in God protects you from that. Catch that. Trusting in God protects you from human opinion. The only way to counteract the fear of man in your life, the only way to counteract those thoughts that you have that go in your mind day in and day out, the only way to counteract that is to be able to understand that God is big, that we trust him, that he's for me, that he's not against me, that he has my best interest at mind, that I can follow him wholeheartedly recognizing that God has good in store and in mind for me. That's what he has for you. And he wants you to trust him, to give him your life, so that as you do that, he'll propel you down life's path, and you'll be able to go anywhere and do anything that God has for you because you're not worried about what other people think. 
You need to replace your opinion of others and you need to replace it with how God thinks about you. And that's the question that I want to ask you today and leave you with. Are you more afraid of what man thinks or are you more afraid of what God thinks? Because God is looking at you every single moment of every single day about what you say and how you act and how you behave. And God's looking at you. And at some point, I think we lose the fear of God because he's just up there and out there. And he's kind of like a parent that, yeah, I love him, but I really need somebody else to fill me. When in reality, we need to flip it and say, God, I need you every minute, every hour of every day because really these people don't matter so much. I want to love them and care for them, but God, you are everything to me. And when you place your trust and your confidence and your hope in him, people get small and God gets big and he receives the glory. That's what he has for you. So then the Proverbs, as it opens up in chapter 1, it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you can understand that God is big, people are small, you'll understand that that's the beginning of knowledge in your life. Proverbs continues to go on and it says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. When you have the fear of the Lord, you have strong confidence. And the next verse in Proverbs 19, 23, it says, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. You see, this is what God has for those who fear him. And I want you to walk along that path. Someone once put it this way, The fear of the Lord is expressed in reverential submission to his will. In other words, you say, God, I want what you want, not what other people want. I value what you say more than what other people say. God, I'm going to submit to you and not to others. I'm going to submit to your will. I want to do and accomplish what you want for my life, not what others want for my life. That's what the fear of the Lord is. And that's the beginning of wisdom. And that's the spiritual hack to this very tricky problem, the clever solution is that we fear God and not people. Would you bow your head and close your eyes in prayer with me?